panel. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our program co-chair, Kim Knox. Oh wait, one last thing. Okay, I know I've spent a lot of time talking about events that we host, but I also want to talk about other things that we do. Today was a big win in San Diego for all San Diegans and the League of Women Voters who help support a new ballot measure for the 2020 um, ballot. It was authored by Women Occupy San Diego, and it establishes the commission of an independent police review committee. So um, huge win today. It's been years in the making. We testified, Kim testified, I was there in support, and so was one of our new members, Kate Palmer, in the back over there. So it was a really fun day, and we all took pictures. It's not often we get big wins like that, so um, I'm really delighted. So I wanted to share with you, not only do we host lovely luncheons and, and events, but we also advocate um, for our San Diegans and for legislation that is important to our, our city. So, okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim. She's going to introduce our speakers and our content. Hi. So, as she said, I am Kim Knox. Um, today we're going to be talking about public banks. And um, with the governor having signed Assembly Bill 857 earlier this month, um, that'll give municipalities in the state the chance to set up and maintain their own banks. Uh, under the new law, cities or counties must conduct a study to assess whether a public bank would be viable and get approval from a state agency to form one. Such banks must also get insurance from the FDIC, and California will only approve a limited number of banks, capping the total at 10. I would like to introduce Ellen Brown. She's an attorney, founder of the Public Banking Institute, a senior fellow at the Democracy Collaborative, and author of 13 books, including Web of Debt, The Public Bank Solution, and her latest book, Banking on the People, Democratizing Finance in the Digital Age. This is Jeannie's copy of one of the books. As you can see, it's getting a lot of good use. Um, she um, lives in California and has been speaking in California and also was recently in South Korea, speaking at a conference, and she'll be in Massachusetts next. Um, our other speaker, Sherry Friedenrich, is currently serving as the second vice president for the California Association of County Treasurer Tax Collectors and has been the treasurer tax collector in Orange County since 2011. She is the first woman ever to be elected to this position and only the third woman elected in a countywide race. Prior to that, she was the treasurer of the city of Huntington Beach for 15 years. As treasurer, Sherry is responsible for overseeing a $9 billion investment portfolio. As a fiduciary and banker for both the county and school and community district. She is also responsible for collecting all property taxes. Sherry is the only woman member of the Orange County Employees Retirement System that manages a $15 billion pension plan. Sherry was instrumental in starting the first ever Financial Planning Day in Orange County a nationwide event now held annually in over 20 cities. She was awarded a Rose Award from the Orange County Taxpayers Association for her work in streamlining property tax payments and saving taxpayer funds, along with many other awards. So we're going to begin with Ellen. Should I just play the video or? Thanks, Kim. So I have a little video that I'm chairman of the Public Banking Institute, and this is a little video that was made by, by us. That just to show where the public banking movement is across the country right now. All across the country, from Maine to Hawaii, Alaska to Florida, California to New York, people are taking back their power from Wall Street by calling for public banks. We want New York City to take our public dollars out of those banks. Yeah. Yeah. We want New York City to put that money in a public why do we need to have to go to Wall Street about our basic needs and necessities of life? Enter public banking, a bank owned by our local government. All across the country, public banking movements are arising from Los Angeles to San Francisco to Seattle to Washington, D.C., the state of New Jersey, the state of Michigan, to New York City and Alexandria's home state. We are witnessing the emergence of an idea whose time has come. Yes. <laughs> Ever since Ellen Brown reintroduced the idea of public banking to the United States in 2011, 
the idea has inspired more and more people. So it would behoove our state and local governments to set up their own banks right now, just if only to keep their deposits safe and leverage your funds into credit for your local community. Imagine a bank whose sole purpose is to make sure that the economy is stronger. That's what a public bank can do. Traditionally, the city of Chicago pays hundreds of millions of dollars in fees and fines and interest rates to traditional financial institutions. And we have to wonder what is the return on that investment. A public bank actually recirculates dollars back into the city's economy. With a public bank, there is accountability and there's transparency. Elected officials and advocates now realize it makes much more sense to cut out the Wall Street middleman by owning their own bank. So some people say, why do we need a public bank? Let's be very clear. Private corporations are not meant to do the business of public good, which is why we need a public bank. One of the bills that I want to draw particular attention is my bill to create a publicly owned state bank of Washington. So the state of Washington's bank account is at the Bank of America. We have a better use for our resources. Why don't we create our own publicly owned bank, owned by us, the taxpayers, and then we can keep our tax money in Washington State and working for Washington State. I'm a big believer in something called the public bank. So here's the idea. All those deposits come on home. They reside in the People's Bank of New Jersey, owned by the citizens. We don't need Washington to form a public bank. You can do it here. The state can do it. States, cities, counties, all across America can do this. With a public bank, a city or state can extend credit to themselves at low interest rates, pay themselves back, and keep the profits in the community. By borrowing money at a fraction of what we borrow it at now, that would really be the biggest help. When the crash hit, the Bank of North Dakota never blinked and the credit kept flowing. We can go toe to toe with the big boys. I think that money should be a public utility, um, not a means of further consolidating wealth. The idea is motivating. Since 2017, over 26 states and municipalities have introduced new public bank legislation. More than 50 grassroots groups are working across the country. So today we are dropping 1,200 pages of signatures. We've got 40,000 signatures in support in this motion, and that we want to move towards a public banking system that is for the Carla, what are you doing? Hey! I'm live streaming, folks! Yeah! Hey! In California, over 150 organizations and over a dozen major cities and counties have voted to support the Public Banking Act, AB 857, which makes it possible for cities to set up their own public banks. Through the hard work of advocates and sponsors, the bill has passed the Assembly and two Senate committees. News outlets are paying attention. This success has inspired New York State to introduce a similar bill, S5565, giving New York's cities a pathway to their own public banks. Join the movement. Go to publicbankinginstitute.org. So, as the, as that video showed, uh, we have over we have active bills in over 26. Um, states and cities across the country and over 50 organizations that are that are promoting the idea to their legislators next uh, what actually inspired the, the this whole latest movement was the Bank of North Dakota which is our, our only state-owned um, depository bank at the moment we also have America Bank of American Samoa which was founded just this year but of course American Samoa is not a state uh, the Bank of North Dakota is 100 years old. Um, I started writing about it after the 2008 crisis because I knew that North Dakota was the only state that had its own bank, so I was watching it. And it turned out it was the only state that escaped the credit crisis that never went into the red. It had the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate, the lowest foreclosure rate, and the most local banks per capita. It didn't lose any banks during the, during the crisis. Uh, and at the same time, of course, we had Occupy Wall Street going on, which um, 
<clears throat> pointed the finger at Wall Street. Before that, the fingers had been pointed at the homeowners, the subprime homeowners, that it was their fault for taking on loans that they couldn't pay, but Occupy showed that it was really um, a fraud or a, at best a negligence on the part of the banks that, that caused this whole collapse. And uh, that got mobilized a lot of people, particularly a lot of young people. And then there was the, um, the Standing Rock protest where more young people met each other and got organized. So first there was the divest movement to pull your, your own individual deposits out of the Wall Street banks. Uh, but that didn't seem to really solve the problem. So then um, there was a movement to have cities and states pull their public deposits out of the Wall Street banks. Um, and a number of cities actually passed such resolutions, including Los Angeles. But they, they haven't done it because there was no place to put the money. That I mean, if you move it out of Wells Fargo, then you're going to have to put it into Chase or some other big bank that's equally guilty of suspicious behavior at best uh, because the community banks just aren't big enough. The credit unions aren't set up for that type of um, managing that type of money. Next. So, oh, so, so public banks was the obvious solution. It's, so that's when they, they got behind the whole public banking movement. So our latest win, of course, that we're all excited about is AB 857. Uh, which, sets, which establishes a special charter for public banks. It establishes a pathway. It legitimizes the whole idea. So you can now talk to your legislators and they know what you're talking about. Um, it, it, the public banks have always been legal, we argue, but, but it was a question. You know, I mean, it's ironic that the people can't have a bank to manage their own money. But there, there was a provision in the uh, California Constitution that was ambiguous and it had been interpreted to mean that we couldn't extend credit to individuals and corporations. But in fact, uh, uh, states and cities are already, they already have loan funds that do exactly what we're talking about. We just want to leverage our money for our own purposes in our own communities. Uh, so, so AB 857 made it official that uh, states and cities and counties and groups of, or you know, regions can set up their own banks. It set out uh, the requirements for setting up a bank and as it went from committee to committee, they kept every committee added some amendment and so at this point, it's got so many restrictions, so much uh, um, protection against the risk that if we manage to jump through all those hoops, we're gonna have the safest banks in the state safer than, than the existing banks. Oh, I'm, I'm not ready for that yet. Um, but what was, the, or, and it also established tax-free tax status for public banks like credit unions. Um, but what was most exciting to us was just the, the movement and the, the amount of support that it generated. We had uh, young people who, we, there were no lobbyists, no professional lobbyists, no money behind this bill. Um, but we just had droves of young people from states up and down the, uh, cities up and down the state. The Public Banking Institute had a retreat a year and a half ago where um, we brought people together from across the country. And um, th that's where they met each other in California. So then they organized the California Public Banking Alliance, which joined over activists in over 10 cities. Um, and. They, it was they who really were the motivation behind this this bill. I mean, we I can say that I started the movement, but really, the, all the all the enthusiasm and um, has come from largely from the millennials. These are the next generation of voters, and the legislators are paying attention. So you would have like one banking lobbyist come out of one of these offices, and then 25 advocates, young people pile in. It was a combination of the young advocates and the older, we've been working on this for 10 years, and uh, so the older seasoned uh, public banking people that knew Sacramento and knew, knew actually you know, how to approach the legislators. So they got, managed to get 183 organizations to endorse the, uh, the bill, including the California Democratic Party and uh, both houses of the legislature have now signed it and, or 
and passed it, and Jerry Brown had signed it. And a week after Jerry Brown, I'm oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm at one governor behind Gavin Newsom. A week after Gavin Newsom signed it uh, in Los Angeles, the uh, the president of the LA City Council had a press conference where he said that we were going to proceed with a business plan for a, uh, or to find an expert for a business plan for an LA City Bank. We had a bill a year ago for uh, an LA City Bank that was put to the voters. It was done at the last minute and we, you know, it was kind of sprung on us. We only had three months to to raise support for it and we, as usual, we didn't have any funding. But nevertheless, because of the just the drive of these young people, it got 44% of the vote, and so um, the president of the LA City Council said he was quite confident that we we would win the second time around. Because the first time around, the big objection was that, like the LA Times was against it, and they said it was half baked that nobody knew what kind of loans they were going to make. I mean, knew anything about it, what it was going to cost, etc. So the next time around, they'll have a business plan, and you'll know all the details before you vote. Next. So there are many safeguards baked into this bill. Uh, the, it, the, uh, the public bank will have to get FDIC insurance, even though we were arguing it doesn't really make much sense, because you have one big depositor in the form of the city or state that's going to have a lot more than $250,000. To deposit, so it's not going to cover much. But nevertheless, we've got to go to the FDIC, fill out all those forms, and get approval. Uh, we need to get Federal Reserve approval. We need to collateralize the deposits, just like any bank has to do with public public deposits. Uh, there has to be an independent board, so it's not run by politicians. It's independent, seasoned bankers, seasoned loan officers. Um, we already, the state, for example, already has a California Infrastructure and Development Bank, which makes the type of loan that we're talking about. And they've been doing it for 15 years. They're very competent at it. They don't do risky loans. They're not squandering the taxpayers' money. They, they know their business. I would say they're more conservative than Wall Street bankers. Um, the, we have to have a business plan or viability study that's approved by the local governing body before it goes to the Department of Business Oversight, which is the department that gives charters. It, it needs to be organized as a nonprofit public benefit or mutual benefit corporation. So that means it doesn't have private shareholders that will take, your, take the profits. They, the benefit of the corporation goes to the community. That doesn't mean that we're going to pay out dividends to the community. It means that will make below market loans to the community and the profits will go back to the local government which can then use that money for things. That, what we recommend is use it for things that you can't really make loans for, like the homeless or you know people that aren't really, really would be risky if you were lending to them. But you can use the profits from your bank to do things for, the, for these, to do, pursue those policies that cities want to pursue that they don't have the funding for now. Uh, it has to have a, um, and there's, um, it's set up as a pilot project, as Kim mentioned. Um, it requires voter approval in counties and non-charter cities. It has to have a public mission and have representation from the local community. It has to comply with the Brown Act, which means that publics have the right to participate in meetings. It has to comply with the Public Records Act, which means uh, records are accessible and requests. And it doesn't, it's not to compete with the local banks, it's to partner with the local banks, and that's following the model of the Bank of North Dakota. Next. So this sounds like a radical and novel idea here in the United States, but actually globally, 25% of banks are publicly owned now, and in the 1970s, 50% of banks were publicly owned. That was before this wave of privatizations that started in the 80s and 90s. Next. Uh, and we, we actually have some very good models in the United States. In the 1930s, when all the banks were bankrupt and um, were not lending at all, Roosevelt set up the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. I mean, it was set up by Hoover, but Roosevelt vastly expanded it. So it was not technically a bank, but it did the functions of a bank. It did lending, and it mobilized, uh, mobilized credit for the country. So it started out with a meager 500 million in capitalization. 
And over the course of 25 years, it loaned or invested over 40 billion. And with that money, it, ma it specifically made loans that were called self-funding loans. So these are loans that pay back, like something that would generate fees. So railroads, farms, um, energy, like dams, etc. cetera. And uh, over the course of that 25 years, it basically rebuilt the country, uh, funded World War II, and turned a profit for the government of six, 69 million in the course of all that. So it was a great model. It was, at, at its heyday, it was the largest uh, financial institution in the world. But of course, the um, private bankers, Wall Street, was always opposed to it. And during the Eisenhower administration, they man managed to get it terminated on the ground that it was supposedly a temporary measure, emergency measure, and the emergency was over and we didn't need it. But really, it was just a huge com competition for them. Next. We also had postal banking from 1911 to 1967. And again, they were um, at their heyday during the 1930s when people were afraid to put their money in the, in the private banks because they were very risky. So people were uh, running in droves to the post, postal banks. The, po the post offices were already set up. I mean, every city had a post office already. And all you had to do was open a separate window for or banking, so you could do your get your mail at one window and do your banking at the other window. The base your basic banking services. And today we have we've had several attempts to revive the the postal banks, including right now there's a bill on by Senator brought by Senator Kirsten Gill, Gillibrand um, that would service that particularly service the unbanked and underbanked which compose 25 percent of the population it could avoid these 400 percent payday loans that the unbanked and underbanked are <laughs> subject to and um, i saw one study that said over a lifetime the unbanked actually pay about forty thousand dollars in deposit just in deposit and checking fees that's not counting payday loans so so they're, they're in dire straits and they need some making and the post office itself needs some new business to keep it going. So it's a win, would be a win-win. Next. Uh, so the Bank of North Dakota in uh, 2014, there was, this, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that said it was more profitable than Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase. It was making over 18% return on equity. So it was an, it's an amazing model. Although it's not trying to make a profit, that's not its mandate. Its mandate is to serve the local, local uh, population. Next. And so how do they do it? It's their business model. They basically cut out the middlemen. Uh, no private shareholders bleeding off profits. They don't pay bonuses, fees, or commissions. They don't have any high paid CEOs or executives. They don't have to advertise. By law, all of the state's deposits are deposited in the bank. And uh, they don't have to advertise for borrowers because they actually partner with the local banks. So they're, they're basically a banker's bank providing liquidity for the local banks. So it's the local bank that finds the customer and has all the branches, et cetera. And they come to the Bank of North Dakota for help if they, you know, it's a, maybe it's a loan they, they're not big enough to take on themselves. And then the Bank of North Dakota will share in the loan. And the savings for, so they make below market loans to uh, various sectors of the economy that they particularly want to support. Next. Um, so AB 857 established that we can have a public bank, but then the question is why, why do we want it? What do we get out of it? Uh, <clears throat> uh, policy makers would say that the city's already had lots of banks and we already have loan funds that are making the kind of, the same kind of loans that we're talking about here. But the difference between a, a bank and a loan fund is leverage. You can make 10 times as many loans starting with the same pool of money if you turn that pool into capital. Plus, uh, private banks, of course, they can leverage, but they are not leveraging for our benefit. They're, we're sending our money off to Wall Street, which is then expanding that into 10 times that sum in loans, um, but not reinvesting it in our local communities and quite often they're investing it in or lending to things that we don't approve of that are actually hurting our local communities. 
uh, and so public banks allow local governance and control of where our money goes and make sure that it goes he right here for us. That was actually the motivation of the Bank of North Dakota. Next, uh, the farmers wanted to keep their money in the state. So North Dakota is actually a very conservative state. It's a Republican state, but the farmers were losing, <coughs> losing their farms to out-of-state bankers and so that's, they got together and formed the Bank of North Dakota in 1919. Uh, and public banks are safer in downturns, and that was discovered after 2008 when it was the countries that had strong public banking sectors that pulled through with they they pulled through without being hurt at least in the beginning from that from that crash. Um, and their public banks, when their private banks are pulling back and not lending, then their private public banks lent more. So they're a good safe, safeguard for a downturn, which everybody seems to think we're due for another one. Next. <clears throat> uh, private, private banks do do the services, but they're quite expensive. There was this study in several years ago in LA that found that uh, more, more money, LA spent more money just on the fees to banks, not counting interest, but just the fees than they were spending on the roads, and the roads are not in very good shape in LA. Um, school districts, for example, in Orange County, were, were paying like three times principal on capital appreciation bonds in order to fund their school development, because they just didn't have any other source of income. And if they don't do that, if they don't just succumb to these big bond issues, then they wind up privatizing public assets, which means we, we're, we, the taxpayers, are still paying for it. We're paying private fees instead of, instead of you know, it gets the government off the hook, but it puts the burden back on us. Next. Um, half the cost of infrastructure is actually financing. This is a basic principle, apparently, of infrastructure funding. For example, the Bay Bridge retrofit, the principal was $6 billion, but by the time you factored in interest, so what we voted on was $6 billion, or what the, whoever voted on it, I don't remember, I suppose it was a state bill, but interest was uh, another $6 billion. The bullet train, the principal was supposed to be $10 billion for the initial outlay, but by the time you paid interest, it was close to another $10 billion. Next. So we have another bill on SB 528 to turn the Infrastructure and Development Bank into a depository bank. It's currently a, a um, just a, a loan fund, but, but it's a good example of what you can do with leverage. So it's got currently has 400 million dollars that was allocated by by the state government 15 years ago to to the I Bank. And uh, they lend it at 3%. So there's a huge demand for these loans, way more demand than there is capacity to cover them. This is, they lend to small and medium-sized businesses. To, they lend to local government agencies that are in, engaged in infrastructure and development. And they have a very good track record for it. They're not making risky loans. But the problem is they're just very small. So if you took that 400 million and you call it capital, now you can make 10 times that sum in loans um, with a 10% capital requirement. So, but you will have costs, and of course the iBank has costs, and when you, they, when you factor in their costs, they're, they're really only making about 1.5% on their money. Um, and I'm, cost is one thing that we're having trouble <laughs> nailing down. That's why we really need an expert to do these, um, these uh, business plans. But from what I've put together from various people, I'm estimating about 1% to serve it. You, you need the deposits to back the loans. And it's about, I'm guessing, 1%. I'd love to hear Sherry's, <laughs> Sherry's comments on that. Somewhere around 1% to, to service the uh, deposits. So, and then you're gonna have other non-interest operating costs. The Bank of North Dakota, we don't know how they do it, but their non-interest operating costs are 13% of their profits, and the um, iBank's non-interest operating costs are 45% of profits, but they do other business besides just making loans, so that may be one reason for their costs. So I'm taking an average and estimating 30% for non-interest costs. 
So I, we can't, we haven't been able to figure out how to do it at 18% return on equity like the Bank of North Dakota, but I can get it to 7%, which is still, if you figure it's only making 1.5%, that's still like five times what they're making right now. And the whole point of the bank is not actually to return a profit. The point is to make loans that local, local businesses just can't get now. They, they can't get 3% loans anywhere. And you can make loans directly to your own public agencies for infrastructure and development at 3%. So that's the idea, that you can vastly expand the credit available in your community. That means you can hire more people, you get more taxes back from from the people and from the businesses. Um, and you actually expand your local money supply because money, most of the money supply is created by banks when they make loans. Uh, that's The Bank of England came out in their quarterly report and said that in 2014. It's very complicated how they do it, but I've written about it in my books and I did bring a few copies if anybody's interested. Next. <coughs> So here's another example. We, um, we passed a water bond a year ago. The voters did for $4 billion. Supposedly, that's what the voters thought they were voting on. But if you read the fine print, it was $4 billion at 4% 4, 4 payable over 40 years. So by you, the time you factor in the interest, it's $8 billion, doubles the cost. If you could do it at 3%, let's say you could do it through something like the iBank at 3%, you could pay it in 30 years and you could save um, half the cost of financing or about a quarter of the cost of the project. Uh, and that's, that's just, that's assuming that you are funding four billion dollars over 40 years. But if you're doing it on a credit line with your own bank or with any bank, rather than through a bond issue, you don't need to be paying on 40 billion, or four billion for 40 years. You can just pay as you go, as you need the money. So. So you would, you would have quite a bit more savings than that. Next. Um, and so those are all just uh, local funding options, like state and local. But central bankers today are now acknowledging that their tools are not working. Um, uh, the head of the Bank of England, um, Mark Carney, said that recently, that we need to have a whole new system. And what central bankers are actually proposing is that governments now start to work with their central banks. And this is what Japan does right now, where the Japanese banking laws are different from ours. And it, they say that um, the government is allowed to, ours say that, you know, or, well, it's, I'm not sure it's a law, it's actually the Bank for International Settlements in Switzerland that says that the central banks are supposed to be independent of government. So you can't use your central bank to fund your projects. But in Japan, the law says that they're supposed to work together. So under Abenomics, uh, Prime Minister Abe is able to go to the Bank of Japan and say, we want to fund this, you know, these certain projects. And then the Bank of Japan, then they issue bonds for the project, and then the Bank of Japan agrees to buy them. So as long as these bonds stay on the books of the central bank, and the central bank returns the interest to the government, which they always do, then it's essentially free money. Uh, and we, this is what central bankers are now talking about, that we're going to need to do more of that, which has been called helicopter money, what uh, Ben Bernanke talked about in 2002 when he was advising the Japanese. So there are many possibilities. And again, the, the objection is always that this would be an inflationary. And I have argued extensively that it wouldn't. But it, again, you, you have to, I mean, it's, it's complicated and I don't have time to go into it. But basically, here's the thing. Banks create money as a loan, but they don't create the interest. So there is always more money owed back than was created in the original loan. So there's always a gap between the money owed and the money available to repay it. And you've got to fill that gap somehow. So something like QE for the people would fill the gap without creating inflation. It would just stabilize the system. Plus, many people would not be spending their money back into, for consumer goods, they'd be saving it. 40% of the population is, uh, I saw in one study, is unable to come up with $400 in an emergency. So those people are not gonna go out and buy new watches and stuff if they get a little universal basic income in their checking account every month. They will save it because they desperately need 
this emergency money or they'll pay off their debts. Hopefully the first thing they would do is pay off their high, high interest credit card debts. So we could use this extra money for many things, the universal basic income, a national infrastructure bank, Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, free public in, um, university tuition are just some possibilities. And I write about that a lot, and again, that's in my books. Next. So these are my three books on the subject, if you're interested, and our website is publicbankinginstitute.org, and my own website is lmbrown.com. Thank you very much. Oh, and I should say, there are two representatives here from San Di the San Diego Public Banking Group, so if anybody's interested in knowing what's going on um, with public banking specifically, it's uh, Ian and Jeff over there <laughs> that just raised their hand. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> As a reminder, there are note cards on your table. If you have any questions, go ahead and write, it, write your question, and people are coming around right now, um, and we'll get to those after Sherry speaks. So. While she's doing that, good afternoon. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for this uh, opportunity to come to provide some education on public banking. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'm going to talk mostly about the impact on the public funds, which is uh, my area. Um, obviously, the legislation was signed. Uh, we were scheduled the panel before, but the AB 57, uh, 5857 was signed, so it is law now. Um, I'm going to cover next slide, please. Uh, two key points today. First, I'm going to talk about the fiduciary responsibilities of treasurers, um, uh, talk a little bit about safety, liquidity, and yield, and then I'm going to talk about the public bank risks to public funds. And so uh, I'm going to start with just a story about why I'm so passionate about protecting and saving those taxpayer funds, which are intended to be used for certainly all citizens that are in that county for those services. Um, before I was in public service, I was in the private industry. I was in, uh, uh, worked for Deloitte. I specialized in banking, so I have some banking background. Uh, but when I was uh, in private industry, I was on vacation with my husband uh, back in 1992, and we opened up the paper one day, and it said Orange County, which is, as you heard where I'm from, um, richest county in the nation. The next day, we opened up the same paper. It said Orange County, richest, now, richest county in the nation, files for bankruptcy. And uh, so that was a billion and a half bankruptcy. And essentially it was caused because the then treasurer at the time took their operating capital, those dollars that they had, all those tax dollars coming in, and they went long. Basically they leveraged that money, they um, invested in things using leverage, and when interest rates changed, they did not have the liquidity to pay the day-to-day payroll for the firefighters, the police officers, so it really hit the community. We just paid back the last of the bankruptcy debt last July, a billion and a half dollars because of that mismatch of those public funds. So that's why I'm so passionate. I'm a CPA. I came in because public dollars should be safe. And so what I want to do today is really educate a little bit on my perspective of the public dollars, which of course are paid by taxpayers. Um, so next slide, please. So treasurers, um, what are our responsibilities? Well, we're responsible for receiving, collecting, depositing, investing, and that safekeeping of all of those dollars coming in, those paid by taxpayers. Um, we're also responsible for, in my case in the county, for not just the county's tax dollars, but all the K through 13 and um, local community colleges are also, I'm their banker. So currently, I invest about four, uh, four, nine billion dollars in total. About half of that, those funds belong to the county, and about half of those funds belong to those school districts, the K through 12 and the community college districts. That does vary. I think the portfolio down here for the county treasurer at San Diego, Dan McAllister, is about 10 billion. So just about the same amount that we're receiving in and investing on a daily basis. So where do those funds come from? In our county, a lot of them come from tax dollars, and most of you, if you own a home, you might have received that little love note in the mail this past week, and obviously those dollars are starting to come in. There's two payment dates, December and April. We probably get about half, we bill about $7 billion, so we get about $3.5 billion by December 10th, and then we get the additional $3.5 billion um, in, in April. And 
essentially for us, same with the county of San Diego, about 94 percent of the dollars that come to the county are to pay for general government services like public safety and your roads, those general government services. Now, our county gets about five cents of that taxpayer dollar. I think um, San Diego gets about 12 or 15 cents, but a very small portion of that. Um, in our case, I think in both counties, most of those dollars go to the state and they're redistributed back to the school districts. But remember, I do invest on behalf of the school district, so some of that money actually stays here and is used for their payroll and their operating expenses. Now, we also get other revenue in. Um, there may be sales tax, uh, transient occupancy tax. There's also government grants, state grants. So there are a lot of dollars that flow through uh, my office. Um, but certainly that property tax is one of those largest single chunks of dollars. So what happens when those dollars come in? Well, what we do is, as each one of you, you get a check in the mail, electronic deposit, you put it into your bank. However, we don't leave the money in the bank because my job is as a fiduciary, my job is to make sure that one, I keep it safe first, um, I make sure it's liquid, and then lastly, I look at yield. But so if I leave the money in the bank, the bank is going to pay me very little as it's going to pay you. If you look at a checking account versus a CD account, you're going to be able to earn more money for that CD than you are for that checking account. So I don't put, we don't really leave our money in the bank. The money that's in the bank today is going to pay for the expenses that go through. I'm going to go um, into investing in U.S. Treasuries, government-sponsored enterprise, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. I'm going to go into the competitive market and look for a return because my job as a fiduciary is a prudent investor and I'm intending to make sure I get a safe uh, yield that's going to be able to pay those expenses when they come due because I've got to make sure I pay those payroll every two weeks. If I don't make payroll because I don't have the money, those people are going to be very unhappy and those are the people providing services to you. Um, so we are very restricted by state code in what we can invest in. Um, they did add the commercial paper of public banks as a, an item that they are going to be able to invest in and we'll talk a little bit about those. But our objectives are safety, as I said, liquidity, and, and certainly yield, because any of you, you don't want the money just to come to me and me not to do anything with it and not earn income. Just like you, you, you have different levels. You have your short-term funds that you need to make um, your rent payments, your mortgage payments. Then you might put money out a little longer because you want to make sure you have reserves. We have some reserves also. But as I say, generally, we are not leaving those funds at the bank to be, in, to be used for collateral for something else. We're investing those. So um, uh, again, those funds we have are really budgeted. You know, we pass a budget every year and that budget says you're going to spend so much of all those incoming dollars on expenses. Now maybe there's a little bit that goes to reserves, but it's a very small fraction of what that is. And San Diego here has uh, I believe they're AAA rated, so they do have good reserves. Those are dollars for those rainy day funds. So the second thing is when we select this depository bank that we're talking about, and certainly um, it's a little unclear in the legislation whether the public bank is required to have that agency deposit their money there or not. And my concern is that safety of that money that's deposited there, um, because most of the bank services that we use are relating to lots of different things, but not just the leaving of the money in the bank. I mean, we have to make payroll, so we have to have payee positive pay. We process millions of checks. We process significant deposits. Yes, there are fees that are incurred on those. Um, those fees would be incurred in any type of a bank because someone has to process those. So there are significant fees, but it's not really because we leave money at the bank. And again, as a fiduciary, my job is to procure those funds uh, making sure I can service, you know, get the service I need. I don't want um, to have funds at a bank that's not going to be able to uh, make payroll for me. If the money's there, it needs to be safe. Obviously, we need to look at their rating. If they're underwriting risky loans and they could go under, that's an issue. Now, we do have this protection. We have FDIC insurance, which Ellen talked about. That's really on the first 250000 Really isn't really an impact for us because that's nothing. For you, obviously, it is important to have that. But what we have here in California is what's also required is collateralization of dollars. So every public dollar that I leave at the bank has to be collateralized anywhere from 102% to 110%. That costs a lot of money. 
because you basically have to buy a treasury or a government-sponsored enterprise, an instrument, and that is backing up in case the market rates go down up to that up to 10%, so that if something happens, now if something happens, I have my collateral, but it's expensive for them to keep. So costs are very significant. The state has a collateralization program, but you of course have to be able to have money to buy that collateral, and if my money you know, I don't have a lot of money that I leave at the bank. You're using maybe other depositors. You're using other things because you're collateralizing a lot more than just me as one public entity. And that, you know, that deposit base, if you only have one customer, you know, do you really want to put all your eggs in one basket? Because if that customer needs change, we have a recession, that's going to impact you. Currently, banks generally try to have a variety of different deposits. They have some checking accounts, savings accounts, CDs. They have a lot of depositors that really help level that playing field. When you have one single depositor, there's a lot more risk along with that. Um, now, just a quick banking education, and I think Ellen went into it. What banks do, as I say, they take in deposits in all these forms of way, and of course, for you to deposit your money there, you're expecting to get some return. So you expect to get a return. You're not going to put your money there for nothing, or you're going to leave very little maybe where you're earning little interest. And then what they do is they take those funds and leverage them, as she talked about, and make loans. Well, for me as an, as an investor, if the state requires me or the local agency requires me to leave my funds there at the bank, then I'm going to expect an interest return. I'm not going to say that you're going to short me because I should be earning an interest. So they're probably not going to save a whole lot from that. It's going to cost them because I would want to go to someone else because if there's lower interest cost to me, that's just masking the profit. They're making more profit because they're profiting off of me. So let's see. So then um, uh, the banking services I talked to, very critical, very important. Obviously, it's not things that you can just start up overnight. Next screen, please. Um, and I'm so sorry. I did, this is what I mentioned to Kim about. When I looked at it at home, I had two different outlooks or two different PowerPoints and one of them was small and so I'm very sorry that this is, uh, I'll make sure we have it available so that you can see these. Uh, the first one here is that, you know, basically my basic presence. Do you want to take day-to-day -day operating funds and leverage those funds to make long-term loans to others? You know, these are funds I need day-to-day. -day. Um, I think the second thing that's really important, we talk about the North Dakota Bank. Started in 1909, great, they're profitable now. A couple of things they've kept in mind. They took almost 30 years to become profitable. So it was not day one, they was profitable. It took them a long time. As you know, at your bank, there's a lot of cybersecurity, a lot of security. You've got to spend a lot of money. Uh, it is a cost issue. I don't know what those costs are going to be, but I certainly know that there are community banks all the time that get started, but larger banks are more difficult because they have collateralization. You have all of these sophisticated services that we need as a treasurer to protect those public funds that we require. So certainly um, North, North Dakota also has a requirement which is a little unique. They require not just the deposits, but they require all their credit card processing to be done by that state bank. Well, credit card processing is very profitable, very profitable. However, if they're making the, the treasurer pay a lot of money for this, pro, for this um, then it's costing me for them to make those loans because they're getting all this revenue in. And if I go out to competitive, I could probably pay a lower rate to process it because there's so much competition. It's probably one of the industries that's just exploded. These are the people that process. You go to a retail shop, they process your credit card. There's so many businesses in this. So that's certainly, that's a requirement. That would, it doesn't look like that's here in our state law. So that would have an impact. Next slide, please. Um, next, again, uh, the, those higher banking costs. It's going to take them some time to get up and running. Who's going to fund those costs? Where is it going to come from? Um, are they ever going to be profitable? Because it is a different industry today than it is before. And you know, how many of you would basically fund a startup? Would you take your your day-to-day -day money to fund a startup? So it is something to consider. Again, as you look at this, that starting up a company from scratch is expensive. Now. One of the benefits for a bank starting up now is you don't have any old bad loans. But we're kind of at a peak in our economy. Are we going to go into a recession? And when we hit a recession, that's the absolute worst time. If you've made a loan and then rates change, you know, equity goes down. It's very challenging. I mean, it's a very specialized industry, um, you know, for that. Um, as we talked about, the cost savings are a little bit uncertain. 
Um, the next thing we talked about is it does say we comply with the Brown Act and we do all of the Public Records Act, but there are significant exemptions in here. Um, the audit committee information is not public as it is in a public agency. We have audit committee meetings that are public. The governance committee, which is the committee that governs everything, those meetings are exempt. Those meeting minutes are exempt. And the, um, I'm trying to think of the third one that's exempt. There's another one that's exempt. So, you know, are we really going to get records? Now, I understand the privacy. I'm completely for, for privacy and security, but these are your public dollars, and how much are you actually going to get of that? Don't you want to know more information about how that underwriting is happening or not? Because if it's all going for public causes, you would want to know that. So transparency of records, I just don't have enough information around, but I'm just, I'm just not sure that that is, is, is there. And I think another thing, go ahead in the next slide, let's see. And um, I think if you're a charter county, we're a charter county, there's many charter cities and counties, you don't even have to hold a vote. It's now you basically can put it in place without any voter approval, and as you know, we want people to be knowledgeable about that. Now, I know LA didn't pass it before. We'll see, hopefully I've provided you some different information that is gonna be helpful as you evaluate this process because you know, our funds don't just sit at the bank doing nothing. They're actually out being invested and earned so that we can make sure that we pay those other expenses. Um, one of the other concerns I have, the law allows for this nonprofit mutual benefit or nonprofit public benefit. Um, it says other pay public bank activities could put risk, or, and then, sorry about that. Um, what is this other activities they can do? It says anything not prohibited by the law. Well, the law doesn't have any prohibition, so does that mean they can go into any other industry or do other things? It's just unclear. Um, most of you probably may have gone to a hospital that's a not-for-profit. Um, have they been run better than a for-profit hospital? Do they have high CEO salaries? Do they have some of those same problems, even though they're not for profit, they don't put a profit at the end? They seem to have issues too, so I'm not sure being a not for profit is going to help you. Now you get the tax advantage, which definitely helps save money. But again, that means that those companies that would have processed our fees and made money off them would have been paying taxes, so that's again gonna hurt the local economy because now we're gonna get less taxes, and are we going to offset that against these cost savings? And the spread is that important amount that you've got, is can you make that spread? Um, member distributions, it doesn't talk about, it just says they can be made. What if there's inadequate capital who makes those decisions? Um, it's just a lot of information that's not there in the law. And as you know, uh, as the League of Women Voters, sometimes laws go into place and they really didn't ask, they didn't provide any details. And unfortunately, that means someone can make those decisions on how to do it, or the law may have to get changed. But if their decisions are made, things could happen that really put those public dollars at risk. Um, again, I talked a little bit about the depository-based diversity, the underwriting standards. Really, if there's no diversity, it's just like putting all your eggs in one basket. One agency has a, a wildfire, has a flood. You know, you're here the ocean, the rising ocean. I mean, lots of things could happen where you tap into those reserves. So certainly, those are issues to consider. Uh, next, um, next screen. Again, I talked a little bit about that loss of tax revenue. Again, it just means that it's going to not come to the agency. So it's a great thing for them. It helps them to actually um, you know, have reduced their cost structure, but someone pays that price because someone was paying those taxes before. And the issue of who pays taxes and whether you know, Berkshire Hathaway or whoever can pay zero taxes or um, you know, that's a, another issue that's not in my mind. This issue, we've got to fix that law, not try to fix it through this law. Um, the local agency deposits can actually exceed the bank equity. That's a little scary for me. Now, it does say it has to be approved by the regulator, but, you know, I'm not going to put 100000 in the bank and find out that bank doesn't have 100000 in equity. They only have 50000 I mean, that puts me at risk significantly. So, again, another risk that's there. Um, another item is there's no rating requirement from the regulators that we have today. Um, you probably all remember Wells Fargo. Um, they, it was in the news where they, on a nationwide basis, did not get those ratings, and that caused a lot of public agencies to say, if it's not rated in the code that you can meet, we can no longer do business with you as a bank. So there's some checks and balances with our existing bank structure that protect those public funds because it means they're not doing their job, and so what we have to do is use a different depository bank. 
again, remembering that those deposits don't just sit there. You know, the, the $9 billion that I have in public funds are literally very little at the bank. They're really invested trying to earn a short-term interest rate, um, not a very low undercut interest rate so I can make affordable loans. Uh, next screen, please. Um, again, the governance structure, this is, um, I, I have some questions. It sounds like there is the law. It says there are some knowledgeable loan people, but I'm not sure that that is, you know, what protections do we have uh, for these? I mean, there's some CEOs of some of our, you know, um, largest, um, you know, United Way, Goodwill, some of them are making millions of dollars and, you know, Yes, they're experts in those business, but that's what they're requiring to come in. So, you know, who is going to be on that board? What are those potential conflicts of interest? Are they going to have that knowledge? It sounds like they need it, but again, is there going to be some conflicts with that? Those are questions I can't answer. It's just that when I don't know, to me, it puts those public funds at risk. And then, again, if I'm required to deposit there, it means I no longer go out and get competitive pricing. That means I'm probably going to pay whatever they, they cost to charge me, because if they've got to process all my checks, they're going to charge me those costs because um, they need to get those revenues in. And if they don't charge me, then is it a gift of public funds? I mean, you know, those, those services, someone's got to pay those salaries for those people who are processing them. Of course, it's without profit because it is tax exempt. Um, and then again, just leverage of public funds. You know, when you're taking your funds on a short-term basis and lending long, that is really not what my intent for those public funds are. They're to pay the firefighter salaries. They're to pay the vendors. We need to make sure when those voting, and when we vote, we need to make sure we pay those vendors who are printing those pamphlets. I mean, we want to make sure those are, are being paid. So I think there are some, you know, things to consider as, as we look at this. Um, uh, next page, please. So in my mind, um, certainly with the information I've seen, I think there are risks to those public dollars that they should not be used to, to leverage those other probably good practices that maybe are there. You know, these are not things I'm saying on a governance policy are not good things to do, but we have structures in place. I mean, I sit now on a new joint housing authority. Our goal is to get private dollars in, match those. We, we can issue debt. We don't expect to, but if we were, and then provide those affordable housing opportunities. But there's mechanisms to do that already. Um, there's lots of mechanisms, the iBank, there's mechanisms to actually loan money, and then these are our dollars that are coming in could be from state agencies, but they're expenditure dollars that are in the budget that are planned for those. They're not just grabbing at those taxpayers' dollars that happen to be sitting in the bank overnight to pay those day-to-day -day expenses. They're actually budgeted. So when you look at those, I think that's an important factor. Um, and again, you know, I believe that the leverage of these public funds where they're needed for day-to-day -day budgeted operations, every budget is approved by the, the governing body, putting, it puts them at risk when you're saying, because what happens if, you know, you have all those loans out, the economy goes bad, tax dollars go down, you can't leave that amount in deposit regardless of if the savings are there, it, it, then what, what happens? You know, you have... Um, you can, you can borrow money from the Fed, but again, you don't really want to borrow short-term money to pay off long-term, because that's that spread. You're, you're not going to make money doing that, because you just you take on many risks. Um, let's see if there's anything else. In closing, again, as a fiduciary of taxpayers' dollars and working for all citizens, my responsibility is to keep that money safe, making sure that I can make the liquidity to pay those day-to-day -day expenses. Uh, it's not the pension plan I sit on, where our goal is to try to earn more money. You know, we have a goal of 7%, you know, because long term we could do those diversity of investments. But my day to day expenses are those that are very important. And so, you know, the cost savings, there's so many questions on would it actually ever, ever cost out? You know, a lot of risk to those public dollars. So in closing, I want to thank you for having me here. I'm honored to be here to uh, at least provide hopefully some education from the government side of what happens with those dollars and hopefully promote some thoughts and questions from you guys. All right, so we're going to move to our question and answer at this point. Let me, um, let me just have a moment of how you look through those. Um, I just want to take a minute and let you all know, um, if you're familiar with the league, we're very studious and we research our positions and we don't have a position on public banking at this point and we've offered 
two sides of this story, the pros and the cons of this concept. And um, I just want to make it clear that we, um, as an organization, don't have a position on this at this time. Um, so let's turn it back over to Kim. Um, okay. Well, I will say this. A lot of the questions that you guys um, presented um, include probably what Alan wants to refer to right now regarding um, keeping um, these public banks free of corruption. You know, what is it about a public bank that will prevent it from becoming just like every other bank, um, et cetera. So I think Ellen would like to have a comment um, and then we'll take some questions. Well, that, that's a lot to respond to, so I don't want to take up too much time. But on the Orange County bankruptcy, Orange County is not a bank. That's the whole point. So they were actually lending out the money, which meant the money wasn't there, or investing the money, so it wasn't there. But the way banking works, and I've written three books on this subject, they do not actually lend their deposits. They actually create um, deposits when they make loans. That's what the Bank of England has confirmed. And the bank, excuse me, the bank does not need to cover the whole loan. So all they have to do is to come up with the difference between what they have coming in and what they have coming out during the day. And they, if they don't have the money at the end of the day, then they borrow. So ideally they borrow from their depositors because that's the cheapest way they can get it. But they can also borrow from other banks on the Fed funds market or um, the, on the repo market or from the Federal Reserve. So there are many places they can borrow. So it's not quite as profitable, but they can still find the money. Whereas a loan fund, once the money's gone, of course it's gone and they, and they can't get it back. So that, that's the difference. And our money right now is going into banks which are leveraging it at 10 to 1. They do not have enough capital to cover all those loans. They only have 10% of capitalization and that's the way banking works and that's what, what the law is. Um, that I saw that the, uh, the, the bank, the treasurers are required to protect against risk, but they're not required to invest, uh, reinvest the money in the local community or reinvest it in things that are good for the community. And in fact, they have to make as much money as they can for the for the city or county, even if it hurts us, the, us, the local community. I saw, I'm forgetting what the issue was, but I, I saw that somewhere that that was a legal issue that the treasurer said, well, we, we have to make the most money we can, even if we are investing in, you know, oil companies and private prisons and yeah, all those things that are people. US have. treasuries, GSEs, that's all we can invest in fixed income. So for Walker, I just wanna make sure, oh, okay. pension funds, pension plans are completely different, right, but right. for working capital funds, very limited of very thing. So we can't, we don't have any, we don't have any of those options. So I just wanna make sure that, you know, we're, we as a pension plan, you have absolutely, she's exactly right. But for a working capital, it's very limited. Fixed income, it's gotta have a certain rating and above, so it's very limited. Okay. Oh, good, good to hear that. Um, so, and on collateralization, our recommendation is to um, get a letter of credit from, uh, a standby letter of credit from the Federal Home Loan Banks, but um, we have to get approval from the Department of Business o Oversight. And we already met with her, and she's very tough, the, um, the head of the department, and uh, you know, she's not gonna let anything pass this risky, so it seems to me if we manage to get past all these requirements, we will have a very protected, protected bank. Um, about the BND, to, the Bank of North Dakota taking 30 years to be profitable, this was during the Great Depression. So the fact that they even survived was remarkable. They, it was set up in 1919. The, um, North Dakota was going through its own agricultural depression then in the 20s before the Great Depression hit. So 30 years, I mean, the fact that it came out on top and is brilliantly successful now, I think, is a, is a mark in its favor. Um, <clears throat> Okay, well, that's a few anyway. <laughs> a few points. Okay, so if you want to take a seat and then you guys can share that microphone, or okay. if you don't mind passing it back and forth. Our first question, who actually manages these public banks? How do we prevent corruption, such as local government officials pushing loans to favored business owners? Okay, well, according to the 8857, 
they have to go through the same process that any bank has to go through. I mean, either our money is going to be in Wall Street managed by their people, or it's going to be in our own bank, and the requirement of our own bank is that um, it, has to, it has to be an independent board, in other words, not run by politicians. The politicians can't be making loans to their, their cronies or whatever. And it has to get the approval of the DBO, who is very strict. So I'm sure she'll make sure it's run by good people. You know, I might just respond is that, you know, obviously a person today is not going to be the person tomorrow. It's that infrastructure that's important for government because people change, people get appointed. So, you know, it's that details infrastructure that's really important. And my concern on the, the records exemption is that you're not going to get, I think there's some high level things that are going to be there, but I just don't know the details because there's so many that are exempted from the FOIA and the PRAs, all these critical con committees. I know you're talking about the ballot issue that you just got about the, the, the independent review, um, well that's a little bit of these records. If you can't even see if there's an audit problem, you won't even know those things. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that they have a um, financial audit requirement. I'm not sure that that's the case. Um, if you're a community bank, you may not have that. So I'm not quite sure. But so those are some of the things that we see as risks also that are, that are there. Okay, next question. How would a public bank differ from a credit union? And could states deposit their monies in credit unions? A credit union is not actually big enough to take a state's deposits. And what we're talking about here, a credit union is owned by its members, but its members are individuals. There's no requirement that we all put our money in any particular credit union. So what we're talking about with a public bank is what do we do with our public monies, meaning our government monies. And I think a credit union isn't really have the sophistication to handle the types of services that public agencies need. Um, even community banks don't have those type. That's why we are looking at you know the comp competitive market that's out there. They have to invest a lot of money, but they look at those economies of scale because that's how they're able to to um, you know cover those costs. And of course, they have shareholders, and there are costs that they are looking to make profit because they are a for-profit bank. But community banks and credit unions really don't have the, you know, the collateralization alone. It's just a very expensive proposition, and they don't have those things in place. Okay. What would keep state banks from being as predatory as other banks? And what would keep them from redlining neighborhoods? Well, that's exactly what's in this charter, or what's in ABA 57. It must have provisions in there that... It uses the public funds for the public good, for the local community, and not, not to hurt the local community. And all I would say is state, California is a large state, North Dakota, when I looked at the financials of their, very, very small. So I know that if it was a state bank, obviously, where do you draw that line of who's local? Because it's, it's, a, it's a very, very large state. I mean, you know, it's, it's larger than, you know, every, it's larger than other countries. So certainly those are, I think, some risks that are there too. Okay. Can AB 857 protect PERS and STRS from too big to fail banks? Um, I doubt that we would get the local pension funds. We can't get their, they probably can't get their investment money because they want a 7% return. They're not getting a 7% percent return, but that's what they want, and that would be too pricey for us for capitalization. Um, we could arguably get their deposits, which is only, there's, last time I looked, there was $500 billion in the, in the pension funds, and I think they had $5 billion in, um, in the short term, in uh, transaction deposits, in other words, that is, which they're only making 0.5% of. So we calculate we could offer them more than that as a return on their deposits and get the deposits. But again, that's just a very small percentage of the pension funds. And I sit on the pension plan in Orange County, and what we do is if we have excess dollars, we um, have an overlay fund that we invest those. So again, um, if you're talking about the depository side of those, you know, for me, that fiduciary is 
you know, the leaving things to the banks are where you earn the least amount of interest, so you're generally going to try to put it in a, a short term. And for pension plans, it's really paying their retirees. They need liquidity to pay those retirees' benefits, even though they have long-term liabilities from the pensions, people starting today that are going to have a pension in 30 years, but they do need that liquidity, so they are going to have more liquid funds. But generally, the bulk of their funds are going to be certainly longer because they, have, they, know, their, um, they know their retiree benefit payments. All right, please contrast how a public bank functions versus a Wall Street bank with respect to the Fed, investments of deposits, and regulatory oversight. Well, for regulatory oversight, that's the very point, that's the reason we want these public banks. We don't want our money in Wall Street banks that are speculating with it, that are very risky. There's one risk I should point out that, uh, that I haven't gone into, but under under um, the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010, it, rather than doing bailouts the next time we have a banking crisis, which everybody's anticipating, it's you know the business cycle, we're due for another big crisis, next time they won't bail out the banks, what they're supposed to do, the big Wall Street banks have to bail in their creditors' money. And that, so that means their shareholders first and then their bondholders and their, um, so state governments, or Local governments are secu consider them consider themselves securitized creditors, and so they think they're protected. But under those regulations, the derivatives and the repo um, claimants go first, and they could take they could wipe out the whole FDIC insurance. I mean, or they could wipe out all they could you know wipe out all the money that the bank has, and so. So actually, our public funds could be at risk under a bail-in. I think when you look at the regulatory, if you're in the banking industry, you've probably heard of Basel, Basel One, Basel Two, Basel Three. These are reserve requirements that banks are required to keep. When I looked at the North Dakota Bank, I believe their goal is to have a 10% reserve. Um, I believe Basel is you know, transactional, but certainly they go up to, I mean, the banks we're dealing with, when we're buying our commercial paper from banks, we're looking at 12% above. So I don't know what regulatory agencies, if that, those are not applying to the, the, the bank law here or not, um, because obviously it doesn't apply to North Dakota Bank because they're not, at that, they're not meeting that Basel three. And I would probably indicate that you know, when you're a, a bank that has a lot of customers that aren't just focused on the public benefit, you have different risk levels. You may have some customers who are, you know, very risky, the, the hotel that if, uh, you know, the economy tanks, that they may have a loan out, they're more risky. You may have um, other, other customers that are very solid, um, loan is the value ratios, and the loans that it sounds like are intending to be loaned through the public bank are going to be those loans that are going to have a lot higher risk. They're, they're being loaned to people who probably aren't able to pay those back. I mean, you have lower rates, but they're to some of those most vulnerable people to try to get them on their feet, but those are ones that could require higher reserves, and I'm just not sure of how those reserve limits, I didn't see anything about Basel III, any reserve requirements where, like I say, I did see just on the website for the North Dakota bank that it was and I think a couple of banks that recently um, in Germany were um, were forced into liquidation just in 2012 um, two of them one was forced into liquidation and one was due to trading scandals and that was a, a public bank we talked a little bit about corruption and then um, another bank was sold to a private equity firm after generating massive losses for those state owners and then I think one of the other scandals was back in 1992 which again is a long time ago but it goes back a little to that contraption a con corruption is it was there was a House of Representative bank just for the House of Representatives back in DC and they found that people were actually writing checks that they didn't have enough money and they were being cashed and so they closed that bank so there are risks that I think are out there that are certainly important to look at are there protections in place to do those or are those other options available thank you um, how do public banks partner with other banks so that there are no need for ATMs Etc. And then also, would public banks increase the savings account rates? Um, the, the public bank would. You could do different models, but what we're what we're recommending is to follow something similar to the Bank of North Dakota, at least, where you're a banker's bank, the, where the the public bank is a banker's bank, and partners with the local banks. So the local bank has all the branches, has the ATMs, has the tellers, services the 
the public, you know, individuals and corporations, etc. And then they actually go to the to the public bank for liquidity for help with their with their funding. Or if you had something like turning the um, the infrastructure bank into a depository bank, it would be making the same kind of loans it's making now. It would just be making a lot more loans, but these would be to like small and medium-sized businesses and to local agencies that do development. And I think um, uh, she's exactly right. The law says you're not to compete with local banks unless there is an area where they're not providing some of those local services. That's the only time, I believe, and that is similar to the North Dakota Bank where they don't compete. They have these participation loans. Um, my question would be is, it's like um, right now Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, they are basically funding mortgage loans for homeowners. And they have programs where they're sharing some of the risk with the people who are buying them, but Fannie Mae is maybe sharing a lot more of that risk. So is it a 50-50 or is the public bank taking 80% of the risk and the participating bank is only taking 20%? I don't know those items, how they would be, because certainly it's that risk to those public funds and that risk of loss is the key that it is for us. So again, um, you know, you don't know, but they don't compete generally except for where there's not there. And you know, it is this participating, but we just don't know any details and could each bank essentially identify those parameters individually and so you could get some people who aren't as knowledgeable and others that are much smarter and maybe have prote more protections. Okay, what statutes exist or are needed to keep treasurers from investing in industries that are not socially responsible for the public good, such as gun manufacturers? <laughs> Again, from the from the operating funds, we can't invest. The protections are completely rock solid. We cannot invest in those um, other than if they did issue commercial pager, they, we would be able to do that. So I guess in that case we would, but is it, it is a fixed income. Pension plans, again, that's up to the governing board. Those are the types of things that that governing board would make a decision on. And, you know, it is a balance, um, you know, because you do have if, if you're investing, I think it, you know, as an example, the tobacco industry, obviously it's a sin, you know, tobacco causes cancer, it has very negative effects. A lot of people, I'm sure all of you have, know people who have lost uh, their lives to cancer. Um, but the years that the state CalPERS and STRS got out of that business, they lost a lot of money. So their, their services had to be lower because they weren't making some of those funds because someone else picked up that, that, that that goal. Hopefully the goal would be to, you know, have the regulators say we have to um, monitor, you can't be just exposing all of these bad things. Now guns is a different because that is, certainly there's regulations going on, but I think certainly from uh, the working capital perspective, that's not something that would be there, but that bank could certainly say we aren't going to make loans, participatory loans to anyone um, that has got in one of those industries. Okay, won't the Federal Reserve approval be not forthcoming because it's controlled by Wall Street? Um, the American Bank of Samoa did manage to get Federal Reserve approval. It took them two years and we heard behind the scenes that the re reason was that the Fed was reluctant to establish a precedent for public banks, but they have. They've established a precedent. So if American Samoa can get Federal Reserve approval, surely the state of California can. And I think there's many state chartered banks. Um, if you look at a lot of the smaller banks, they're all state chartered. So they certainly have some different information that they've got that they've got. If you go online and you look for state chartered banks, you're going to see, I don't know, 40 or 50 of them. So the state has, you can be federally chartered or you can be state chartered. Now, I'm not sure the Federal Reserve role that they have to approve both of them because, of course, everything would go through the Fed wire system. I mean, it's a very important system. We wire all the time. Those are those costs and that infrastructure that you have to have in place in order for a public agency to do business. Um, but there are a lot of state chartered banks and I would think that that's something that California has some expertise in. Yeah, and so we're talking about state, state chartering. What you need the Fed for is you need a master account so that you can um, right. yeah, trade with other banks basically. How much interest do San Diego or Orange County pay for capital outlay? Um, as I said, I think uh, San Diego is AAA rated, which is the highest rating you can be. So they're going to be at the lower spectrum of interest costs. Uh, Orange County is AA plus. 
Um, we've been gradually moving up. Once we paid off that bankruptcy, we were double A minus, double A. So it, it does vary. Most of the municipal debt is issued in the tax exempt environment. And um, we're in the process of uh, uh, buying some, um, our, our county is prepaying their pension plan. Um, it allows them to take a discount. And so uh, I, as treasurer, am doing a private placement with them. So we're actually purchasing those that um, we're, we're loaning them the money uh, because I know it's a good credit. We do our due diligence and we're probably going to be paying probably 1%. I mean, it's a fairly low amount. In addition, I have the ability by state law to um, loan school districts their own money. And so this is a temporary transfer. And so I can loan them at the rate of my pool. These are very limited instances. And again, because I get every penny that that school gets in, if they didn't pay it, I would just take it out of their next property tax apportionment. So I have security 100%. And these are funds that aren't used for day to day, but of course they're not in the bank either. We have invested them. So, uh, so it, it certainly, the, the rates are fairly low because rates are coming down right now. I mean, right now I think our portfolio is earning about 2%. So if that gives you a feel, but the debt is gonna be a little bit higher than that for, the, for a longer term debt. All right, I think it's just about 1.30. Mm -hmm. um, if you are both willing to stay a few extra minutes, we do have the room until two o'clock. Does that work? Sure. I can stay a little. I do have to get back and work in the office, so uh, okay. if we could maybe keep moving through them and, yeah. you know. And if anybody needs to take off, feel free. Um, to whom do these banks lend? Um, individuals, public projects, organizations, or all of the above? Well, if we follow the Bank of North Dakota model, we'll be mostly lending to um, small and medium-sized businesses in the local community or to, to public agencies. Um, the, the, the Bank of North Dakota does make student loans, although they've recently cut back on their student loan program. But it, again, it's, it's, they're filling a function that wasn't being filled by other banks. So. so we're not talking about making risky loans to the unbanked and underbanked. The, 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 risky, the risky things that need to be, sectors that need to be supported, we would suggest you use the profits generated by the bank to pay for those programs, but we're not talking about making loans to businesses that can't get loan, can't get funding anywhere else. It's businesses that need to get lower cost funding so that they can, you know, expand. And I might just add, it's that profit that I would question, and I'd want to dig down to the detail for North Dakota. It says they've, you know, made 50 million, or this last year I think it was 183. How much did the treasurer spend more, or what was the internal cost to that other side of that state because they didn't earn the interest income they might have, or they had to pay a higher merchant processing fee because they have to pay the cost of whatever that processing is? Those are the questions I would ask. Could they have gotten lower costs? But I don't know those answers. Yeah. I, I'd say that. Um, they pay, they said, the Bank of North Dakota say they pay competitively on deposits, and when I read that, it was like 0.5%. And in Los Angeles, we make zero on our deposits from um, Wells Fargo, but Wells Fargo does service, service the deposits, so that's the difference. Right, no one makes zero on their deposits, so I know that's not true. What the, what the banks do for institutional customers, they give you what we call soft credit, so we would get credit against um, yeah. our fees. So you are earning interest. Obviously, it is a lower interest than you would get if you want to go out. But you, you aren't not, money at the bank isn't not earning anything. It's just how much would that pay? When I went online, I did say they paid 0.25 less than competitive rate. So again, if you take that 0.25, you take it times nine billion, it starts adding up to some dollars depending on how much dollars are there. Previous public bank proposals stalled politically. What has changed to make this more feasible today? I think one thing that has changed is people, be, are be, first of all, they're becoming very disillusioned with Wall Street. They don't want, particularly like the millennials, do not want our money in Wall Street making investments that we don't approve of. And um, there's just more awareness of how banking works. You know, it used to be that that the Federal Reserve was treated like the temple. There's a book about, you know, the Fed is the temple. I mean, it was, people didn't question. It was, we left it to the experts. It was just sort of a boring and wonky field. But now that we had the 2008 crisis, people are questioning and they're looking into it and more and more people are understanding how the whole thing works and they're saying, why are we giving away 
the ability to leverage our own, to create credit for our own local communities. We're giving it away to Wall Street, which is not using it for our benefit and is using it often against our benefit. I'm just not sure, um, again, what change, if we aren't leaving money at the bank, they're, they're still going to continue to do the same practices they have, and they have, as, a, as, a, as an entity, have their governing board that's going to do those practices, and certainly that regulation is important to prevent those abusive practices and, you know, eliminate those because that's not good. We don't want those, uh, the corruption in the private industry, but I'm not sure if they aren't using those dollars, what if they wouldn't continue some of those types of same th same things they would do, what, what's going to change from them? Now, again, if they didn't get the fees from us, that is going to affect those revenues, but are there others that are out there that, that would, would fill in that gap? I, I don't know. Okay, this question is for Sherry. It says, I hear the concerns regarding income versus fees using private bank. Doing a complete analysis regarding in income versus fees, which type of banks would be most economical for our public funds? I wish I knew that answer. Um, obviously, as a fiduciary, that's my responsibility is to balance those costs because every dollar that I spend in a fee um, to pay someone something, it means it's not going to the services that go for our county, those public services that we provide. So, you know, we do competition. We go out for RFP. We try to get competitive sources. That's usually a kind of a savior because when you look at those competitors, you assume that no one's going to undercut and if someone undercuts you actually review those service levels to make sure they can manage it and that's why community banks may try to be part of the RFP but they usually can't meet all those service needs that we have because it is more sophisticated but certainly you know on credit card processing I know I reduced ours by 10 percent because I hate those credit card companies they just gouge you in terms of these fees and you know I want to try to leverage and say government doesn't have um, you know, government doesn't have a product that you that walks off uh, the the clothing that walks off to the street. We don't have a product that we can't get back. If someone doesn't pay their taxes, they pay a bad credit card. I just put the taxes right back off of the property, and I can sell it if no one pays them. So we don't have those type of of um, fraud, and so our rates should be lower. But that's a different issue. That's where I'm trying to lower those rates by looking at the the benefits and leveraging more governments together to do that. All right, last question. By offering low interest loans to local businesses, are we not just providing a method for them to increase their own profits? Um, we're providing a method for them to hire more people, increase the productivity of the community, pay more taxes, etc. I, I, for example, know somebody who had a 7% credit line for his small business before 2008. Then they canceled, the bank canceled this credit line, not because his business had changed, but because the bank's practices had changed, and now he has to borrow at 17%. Well, he has to pay workers and materials and wait whatever three months or six months or whatever until, until the, his invoices are paid. So he has, to, he has to operate on credit, and credit is just very expensive now for, for our local businesses, and that's why our local economies are not thriving. You know. And I would hope that that bank has strong underwriting and they have levels when you, is it prime, prime plus one, prime plus two, and they look at that, the more riskier you are, you are going to have to pay a higher interest and that's probably what we would want. We, want, we wouldn't want everyone with different risks to pay that same interest rate. So I, I hope that that stringent underwriting is really the critical point and I don't know his businesses, I, I, you know, I'm, you know, that's where can there be grants or other dollars that can come in from other budgeted services that could perhaps help those, bis those small businesses because so small businesses are hurt the most. As banks get out of some of that lending, then others have to come in and what other options are there to do that and you know, how can government through some of these loan programs make some of those where maybe everything isn't paid back. Maybe there is if you improve or you add so many jobs, you're able to get credits or something. Um, but, you know, I, I would hope those lending underwriting standards would charge different interest rates based on that risk, not because they don't like that business. But, again, I, you know, they're in business to make money, and so that is part of it. And, but not-for-profits aren't in business to make money, but they still spend a lot of those costs. There's just not as much competition. All right, thanks very much to both of you. Let's give them a hand.